personally, he's also been restoring the body. As uh, I put out in an email uh, many, many months ago, um, <clears throat> I was just uh, compelled by God and sharing with uh, my pastors around me that, hey, I'd love to see God restore the body principle in his local church. So that is what he has done, and he is doing it. It's an active thing. Then we looked at two weeks ago, which was uh, uh, 11, uh, well, I think it was the second Sunday, so I have to go back, 11, 12, 11 22. Um, I just messed with you guys. Look at that. You're going to have to switch me back over. I, I like messing with those people. Just to, the, the, the be, very best people are up there in the presentations ministry. So thank you, Rachel, for jumping in there. Sorry for messing with you. You're awesome. But we looked at let's give thanks. And so we said, okay, we're going to give thanks. And one of the pieces was what we do on Sundays. That as our gathering in the temple, uh, getting together in youth ministry right now, our Sunday groups are getting together, the people that are up here singing and praising the Lord, the different ushers, the welcome team, all those things, the people that are teaching children on both sides of the building. So we said, let's be reminded of what God allows us to do every Sunday. Let's give thanks. We do this often. We have to do it. We do it once a year to give thanks to the Lord. Remember what he's doing. And then as we looked at last week, we said, let's continue for his glory. We said, okay, we'll continue for his glory. So where, we at, where we're at this week is, okay, what's next, pastor? Are you just going to preach those same three messages all over again? Well, actually, yes. That's what I was going to do is repeat all three of those messages. Um, no. See, we're going to head into a place here that continues out of nothing is beyond his grace, as we reviewed last week. And those first few months of this year and how we also had a, a Bible study in Nehemiah and restoring the body. I mentioned this last week and uh, our preaching series for a few weeks is life in his kingdom, looking at the Sermon on the Mount and how Jesus Christ was preaching about the righteousness of himself versus the righteousness of the religious people and how clearly he made it uh, for each one of them that was in the audience. All the Jews... And then, of course, that were, were not believers, that were not followers, and then his disciples that he called that were in the first days, in the first weeks of their fellowship of Jesus Christ. And we would regard that as his very first and longest preaching sermon recorded in the Gospels. And we looked at that. And then we've been in the Bible on Wednesday nights with the Bible study, uh, our last one of this year. And We've been looking at the study of the book of Colossians, which has been good. We've had a really neat time. We've got a couple more Wednesdays to go. If uh, on Wednesday you want to jump in on Zoom, Dwayne puts out a link every single Wednesday for you to jump in on Zoom. If you want to stay at home and, and stay distant, that's cool. The, uh, the um, notes and everything, he'll send them to you. If you want a copy of the notebook that we've been using just ask our office, and, and Don or Mindy will get it to you during the week if you want to come by. But we've been in a study in Colossians, and uh, only Jesus. We're going to look at uh, cranking out chapter 3 and 4 the next two Wednesdays. So that's where we've been together as a church, knowing that each one of these pieces God is using to restore the body principle, and he's doing it, and we give him glory. And we continue, last week as I spoke, continuing for his glory off of our Acts 1A conference, Uncommon, and looking at the faith that God would have us to have that would stand out, that it would be uncommon, that, um, as the verse says, but a faithful man who can find people should be able to find you and me as faithful. So what does that bring us to? Well, our youth ministry got going yesterday with a Thanksgiving dinner. Um, they went a little bit later. I, I figure you can have Thanksgiving dinner anytime, right? You know, you have turkey, uh, you know, a little stuffing. They, they had a good meal. You could have come in for seconds. They had, they had a little, you know, hy V have been doing good lately. Free commercial. hy V catering is awesome these days, so they've been good. But he introduced something yesterday to his youth group, and that's a, uh, a new look. We've had the name of Bridge Youth Ministry for a long time, the Bridge, or and before that, uh, uh, another uh, name that was called. I believe we uh, was uh, we changed that. I don't know, late 2000s, early 2010, whatever was uh, Directional Youth. Well, now the youth is uh, the youth group of First Bible Baptist Church is centered up on Primed, become good ground, and that has been the youth pastor's heart 
as he rolled that out yesterday, I thought, what a great idea. So uh, when I heard that he was doing it, I thought, gosh, that's a great idea. Maybe I should try that, you know. So well, this has been something that's been going on for a long time. And uh, something that uh, God has instilled in my heart. And so uh, as you listen to this, as you track along what we're about to get into, I've been around this passage of Scripture for a little while. We studied the book of Acts a couple, two or three years ago, and a lot of that came out of that time uh, looking at Jesus and his church. And after we went through a, a couple of different Acts 1A conferences where our focus uh, was, of course, uh, looking at uh, the evidence of life. What's our new life in Christ look like? We looked at the miracles of Jesus Christ. We looked at um, the healings of Jesus Christ, different things like that. But we also uh, went verse upon verse in Acts chapter number 1 all the way through Acts 29. And through all that time, even since the 20th anniversary, and thinking, okay, God, what would you have us to do? Here's where we're at. December uh, 2020, May 2022 will be the 25th anniversary of First Bible Baptist Church. And we're going to have a big shindig. I think that's what they used to call it back east. I don't know. We're going to have a, a Snowville extravaganza in the spring. We're going to have a sweet time of celebrating all that God has done, celebrating God's people, most of all, celebrating the Lord Jesus Christ. As I prayed through what it would be like between the years of the 20th anniversary and the 25th anniversary, I thought, gosh, that's so far away. But as a study time that God has given me, my own personal worship time, there's been so much that's uh, been stirring in my heart. A lot of things came uh, to me through 2019. I, I had the honor and privilege of traveling to Africa, spending a little bit of time with Brian and Tammy and Titus, uh, try, Titus tried to take me out and hit a ground ball and hit me in the lip and uh, made me bleed. Uh, but you know what? Bleeding in Africa hurts just as much as bleeding here. But they wanted to take me to a hospital. I said, no, you told me don't ever go to a hospital in Zambia unless I wanted to pass away and go home to see Jesus. So I listened to your advice over all these years. I told them to put some tape on it, or as you would say, rub some dirt on it. And, uh, but what a time there. I had an opportunity to go to Bogota, Colombia, and spend some time with a missionary that we have supported for a number of years, David Guadron. Um, had a chance to go visit my family together for the first time uh, since, uh, since my daughter passed away, and it was a celebration. I went to a, a wedding last summer for my niece, Alex, and that was so good and being around my family. And, and God, through all of that, working through some things, but most of all, in his word and in the spirit, uh, this has just been bubbling in, in me and, and, and from the Lord. And so this is a very important time. It's a very, very important message I want to deliver. It's the first time that you're going to hear about this, but it will not be the only time. It'll be an introductory, initial statement of uh, what do we do and how do we do it and what are we about. You see, when you look back on the back wall when you leave today, there's two beautiful pieces of wood that say Acts 1-8. They're not going anywhere. The church is compelled and been called by the vision of the Holy Spirit of God, by the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 1-8, he very simply said, But you, but you, but ye shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes, and when he comes, after the Holy, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. You know what? That's forgotten sometimes, but it can't be forgotten. This is the vision of Jesus from the Father through the Holy Ghost, the triune power of God upon every single church. The mandate, the commission, the command, whatever you want to call it, that's the vision of the church. To receive the power after the Holy Ghost has come, be witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part, which talks about evangelizing, discipling, planting churches, supporting missionaries all over the country and all over the world. 
to then make sure that we glorify God, that we are more like Jesus Christ always. And then you turn to Acts chapter number 2, after they have spent time in one accord, they have spent time in prayer, they have spent time just waiting on the Holy Ghost to come because they knew it was going to come. Jesus Christ was not going to be someone that was going to speak of something that was not going to happen. He promised it was going to happen, and they were waiting on Christ. And then Acts chapter number 2 happened. And as we've looked at it, we've been reading this passage of Scripture from verse number 41 down through 47 on our Wednesday night missions nights. We've been alluding to it, looking at it, because it says in verse number 47, praising God. So that's what we've been doing for the last few weeks is praising God. We want to praise God for what he is doing and what he has done and what he is going to do. Through all of that and many other things since the last year, two or three or four or whatever, so what's God have for First Bible Baptist Church. The vision remains, but what's the vision? Excuse me, what's the mission for us, and how is it going to lay out for the next 5, 10, 20 years? Well, here we are. Acts 2 Project. This is us. This is the mission we're going to live in. We've already been living in it, and we're going to continue to live in it. We're going to continue daily with one accord. Like last week when we looked at continuing for his glory, it says in verse number 42 in Acts chapter number 2, continuing what? Steadfastly. That they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. This is so important. This is so relevant to the truth of what the early church was to be. This is the first Christian church in Acts chapter number 2. Can we ever be that church? I don't know. I said in the first service, I wonder if we're just So far from that, because we're so carnal, the most spiritual people, I wonder, I've said it before, maybe months ago in a message, I recall, just being in my notes, so I I must have said it somewhere, I don't know, by the Spirit of God, but I wonder if people that were born and were then born again were in the body of Christ a hundred years ago, if they would see us and go, I don't know, you guys don't really look like the believers that I know about. But again, comparatively speaking and contrasting different times, It goes back to those seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. We know what it says about what the church did and didn't do and how the Spirit of God was speaking. No one preaches it better than our associate pastor through those churches and understanding that it's the Spirit speaking. Well, he's been speaking to our church. He's been speaking to all of us individually. We have a temple gathering place, and we know this is a picture of the physical temple that they're talking about in Acts chapter number 2. We'll get to that in a little bit. But you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So that means that you have a spiritual temple. Which temple are ye? Who are ye? You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in all whatsoever you do, in word or deed, Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Each one of these pieces and parts are so significant. So when you look at Acts chapter number 2 and you see this project, you're going, well, okay. And and I'll have a couple verses up there and then we'll have some references. And so you'll need your Bibles here in a little bit. But I'm going to put a few things up there because it does say, And they continue in daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And we looked at the part about continuing last week, continuing daily. But let's not forget verse number 47, which says, Praising God and having favor with all the people. And as, again, we have read this verse and read these verses for the last few weeks, it's been intentional, we're reminded again what it says. And the Lord added to the church daily as such should be saved. You think about the, all the ands, and, and. That's a very, very big and at the end. That's telling you and me the old phrase. I've mentioned it before. Hey, you do what you're supposed to do, and God will do what he's going to do. But if we don't do what he told us to do, then how can you ever expect? You say, well, God's gracious. Yes. Slow to anger. He's merciful. Yes, I get all that. But when you frustrate the grace of God as a church and as a believer, after a while, God just says, fine. And there's enough statements about the church and how it's failed God and the New Testament mandate and the Acts 1-8 vision that we don't want to live there. I would rather live in fulfilling what God's called us to do, the Acts 2 project. 
the Acts 2 project. Let me read something really simply. There's different people that write different things, different commentators. One of them I read, he references this. He says, I have a book called, a little book called Spiritual Fingerprints of the Visible Church. It says, how can you identify a real church? Here's the four marks of identification. First, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The mark of a church is not the height of the steeple nor the sound of the bell. It is not whether the pulpit is stationed in the middle or the chancel is divided. The important issue is whether or not they hold to the apostles' doctrine. Whenever we leave the apostles' doctrine, we're done. You, it ain't, it, 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 you gotta follow what the Bible teaches. We're gonna teach the Bible, we're gonna teach the doctrine, we're gonna teach the theology of what God has mandated for us. Period. Now I just want you, that's, that's it. And when God replaces this guy, my prayer is that you would never ever vote for someone who didn't preach the Bible. They didn't teach the Bible. And that, by the way, we're surrounded with 20, 30, 40 Bible teachers around here who could do a hundred times better than I have and will, but totally and completely the reason why is because they teach doctrine from the Bible following the apostles' doctrine. The second thing about the fingerprints of a visible church is this, that they have fellowship. These people had fellowship. There needs to be fellowship. True Bible fellowship. As 1 John tells us, we're to have fellowship in Jesus and in the Father also. By the Holy Spirit, he puts together fellowship. It's so important. Number three, it says here that they had the breaking of bread. Not just the breaking of bread that is, that is of course, of the Lord's Supper, which is very, very important. It means being brought into the fellowship and relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what they did. They got together. Yes, they broke bread, but they got together in the name of Jesus, had fellowship in the name of Jesus, and they didn't forget who Jesus Christ is and what he did for them. So that's important. That's why we have the Lord's Supper a little bit more frequently. I believe it's very important for us, and God has been using that to get us to a place of examining ourselves and then remembering what Jesus Christ has done. And then the fourth, prayers. I'm afraid in the average church today, it says in his little booklet, it is a little fingerprint that is, prayer is the evident weakness of the church. Actually, the greatest asset of any church is prayer. I would agree. So we need to do something about that too. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do some things about some of these things. And we're going to do some things intentionally not to take away of the things that we're doing in the mission, but rather to add a couple little places. You say, well, you're going to add more things for us to do. No, we're going to keep the essential things, the essential things, the most important things. And we're going to continue to remind, be reminded that there are a lot of important things we do. So this is what we're going to call it. The Acts 2 project is to refine the mission. Refine. You like that word? It means a lot. I was looking at reset, revive, renew, re, 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 re. If you study anything about the ad or uh, basically the word, the prefix re says again. Again. To do it again. To repeat. To revive. If you've been vibed, then revive. But we look at this and say, what does it mean to refine? Well, the Strong's says to fuse, to be the founder or refiner, to melt and purify, purge away. What does it say in the Bible about refining? Let me give you some Bible verses. I know you've been in Acts 2 for a little bit. Let me have you jump into your Old Testament for a moment. I want you to see why we're going to refine the mission. Isaiah 48. Now, for all of you who aren't used to uh, going through your Old Testament, uh, it's time to do that. So here we go. Isaiah 48. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. You're getting there. There you go. Isaiah 48. And then we're going to go to Zechariah. That's only a little bit to the right. You're going to be all right. Here you go. Breaking new ground in your Bible. Let's pick it up on verse number 9. For my name's sake, the Lord God says in reference to the nation of Israel as he's going to deal with them, then and further in prophecy. For my name's sake will I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not oft. Verse number 10 says, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. That's how he refines the mission. He puts you through affliction. He says it in the nation of Israel, and he says it to the church as well, because all scriptures give him inspiration to God, and it's powerful doctrine and reproof and correction. This is good reproof for me. It says in verse number 11, for mine own sake, 
Even for mine own sake will I do it. God does it for his glory that he will refine you. He will refine you through a furnace of affliction. He says, for how should my name be polluted? I will not give my glory unto another. Whew, that's good stuff. That's the Bible. Again, I say often, you want to be a good Bible teacher? Just repeat what God said. Go to Zechariah chapter number 13. Let's repeat what he says in Zechariah. If you want to find out where Zechariah is, keep on going to the right. Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, all that stuff. Or you can do a little cheating. Go to Matthew and go backwards to Malachi. And then when you go to Malachi, go one more and you're in Zechariah. There you go. Zechariah chapter number 13, verse number 9. Here you go. This is how God shows us what about refine. What, how does he want to refine? You say, well, that's always like a reference to the Bible and the purifying. You study this thing and you'll find out that he refines and has refined people. He refines people. It's powerful. And if you'll do it in the furnace of affliction for the nation of Israel, he'll do it anyway. Verse number 9, chapter number 13, he says, and I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. Silver, the price of redemption, gold, royalty, the glory of kingship. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. Ooh, that's a refining. God's refining the mission for First Bible Baptist Church. Malachi chapter number 3. Oh, we're going to go to Malachi, and we're going to talk about giving. Well, that would be fine, but we're going to look at this as Malachi 3 and what he's saying about how he wants to refine us down the road. Of course, he's, he's looking at all this passage of Scripture of Israel and prophecy down the road, but God wants to work in us as well, and it's leading up to the day of the Lord, and you're saying, okay, what is he saying? In verse number one, pick it up, chapter number three, behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek, ye shall, excuse me, ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse two, but who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. And he shall sit, it says in verse 3, as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, the priests, the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver. And they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. This is what we would ask God to do for us as a church and to refine the mission of our church. Refine it. We haven't messed anything up with being on the mission God's called us to. We've been fulfilling what God would have us to do. But this is even further. It's a little bit deeper that God would refine the mission. So God, how do you want to refine the mission? Well, there's two aspects that I want you to look at. I, I, I forwarded this a little bit. Let me get into these two aspects for a moment, and then we'll finish up. So these are the two places of where. How will he refine the mission of First Bible? Well, the two wheres are in the temple, here, and then house to house. So here are the two. Let me just show you a little something. House to house in the temple. We're going to continue daily with one accord. We'll look at the one accord part here in a moment. That's the how. But, but let me ask, when you look at how God would refine our lives or refine the mission, you think about having something refined. And we know that there's that, uh, I mentioned it in the first service, and they, they told me what the name of it is. I forgot. What's that, what's that show where, where they got the, 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 the smiths and they, they have the metals and they make things? What's the name of that? Forge the fire. Okay. Woo, forge. Okay, so we're going to forge something. So we want God to do that. We used to have an aspect of our men's ministry. Old Mitch Dobson used to have a, a, a part called Forge, and the guys would get together over the Word of God and let God refine us. Well, what is going to happen for refine the mission when it comes to being in the temple? When we get together in the temple, you say, well, again, this is a spiritual temple, but yes, this is a physical temple. As Strong's Concordance defines it, it's a sacred place. It's a temple. It's used... To reference, of course, the temple of Jerusalem, which is where they're at. So if you go back to Acts chapter number 2, then I'm going to use a, a few other references, but I'm going to use the book of Acts here in a little bit. But in Acts chapter number 2, we're reminded that they continue daily with one accord in the temple. The word temple in the New Testament from your Strong's Concordance says this. 
with respect to the temple at Jerusalem, also it often referred to the entire precinct, which included sanctuary, it included the courts, and included all the other buildings. The temple of Jerusalem consisted of the whole of the sacred enclosures, embracing the entire aggregate of the buildings, balconies, porticos, courts, all of that. So this is our place. We've set aside this place. We could say it's our holy place. Now I know, again, the New Testament tells us that the Holy Ghost is in here, and we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. But as we reference what we ought to do, continuing daily with one accord, what do we do to gather together, and how do we do it in the temple? Well, chapter number 3 is right after chapter number 2. Look in your Bible. It says there, Peter and John went together into the temple to the hour of prayer. At an hour of prayer being the ninth hour. The ninth hour being 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They had three times of prayer, three times that they prayed. So you get an idea. The first, 6 a.m., you, you, you get an idea of the day and what you're doing. There's three times that they went to prayer. And this is one of the times that they went to pray. And they went to pray at the temple. In the ninth hour, which was, again, in the afternoon. Okay? So it's a principle that was instilled through the Old Testament by Abraham, Isaac. It, it, it's something that you and I have to realize that that was put in place by God for a reason. It says in verse number 2 that there was a certain man hanging out. He lay daily at the gate of the temple. Why? Because there was business that was going on, plus people spiritually were there to give alms. Verse number 3, who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. So the temple, everything going on in the temple, everything going on here for us to see that things go on at the temple and their spiritual matters. This is the early church. This is the first time that we see the church really doing the church business. You see in verse number 8, and he leaping up. Who? The lame man who was healed. He leaped up, stood, and walked, and entered that with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising. And of course, the people here, there in the temple, praising and seeing the works of God that were done by these apostles. You see, in the temple, we want to see God do work. We want God to do holy work. We want to see God do the miracle of passing someone from death to life. When someone gets saved at the altar, it's in the temple, and it's a miracle, is it not? Well, that's what happens. That's the kind of stuff you want to see happen in the temple. Chapter number 5, verse number 20, says similar things about what happens in the temple. If you see there, go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. What? The apostles were preaching and teaching about Jesus Christ, Peter and John. And if you go back further, you see that the, the, the apostles were, were put in jail. They were put in. The officers came and put them in prison. And, and then they got released. And it goes down further to see that in verse number 22, the officers came. They found them not in the prison. The accounting is, of course, the prison truly found. We were shut all to safety in verse number 23, standing without before the doors. But when they opened, we found no man within. They left. And where did they go? Verse 24, now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them wherein to this should, would go. Then came one and told them, behold, the men whom you put in prison, they're standing where? In the temple. And they're teaching the people the temple. We get together on Sundays and we teach the Bible. We think that that's pretty important. Do you? Okay, I thought that you might think that's very important. At least, Bobby, I'm glad you do. Thank you that all the others I think they agree it's an important thing but what happens house to house well this church again in May it'll be 24 years that it's gotten together in the early years of it as I understand and here uh, before we moved here in 98 and then I was part of that but it got together around the Bible they got together and they first started meeting and they got together uh, um, in the basement of, of uh, KCBT and and uh, Donuts and Bible. We could do a little D&D. &D, donuts and doctrine. So there you go. And then it continued. When we moved here in 98, there was Bible studies in every different part of the area that people, there was people that were in Blue Springs and people in Lee Summit. There was Bible studies. And people were getting together house to house. I heard that's a good principle. You go to house to house to to have fellowship, you go house to house, breaking of bread, house to house to, to answer prayer, I mean to take care of praying together, then answering the prayers of people by going out to different places. 
what it means to go house to house, any building, whatever, the house of God, or just an inhabited house, somewhere, house to house. It says in Acts chapter number 11, very, very simply, that this, this group of people, this early church people, in verse number 11, chapter number 11 of Acts says, And behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house where I was, sent from Caesarea, and the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me and were entered into the man's house. What is this? It's Peter's accounting of what happened when he goes back to the church people and says, I want to tell you what happened. The Holy Spirit got a hold of me, told me to go to this man's house. I went to this man's house in Joppa, and he came to Jesus, and his whole house came to Jesus, and they all got baptized, and it's a powerful statement about what happens house to house. You say, well, we got mandates, and we got things, and we can't, and we can't. There's people that have been getting together for months and months and months. Amen? Amen? We just keep on getting together. And keep on getting together, and we'll find a place for you to get together house to house because it's very, very important. If you go back to Acts chapter number 5, let me just remind you of verse number 42, 41 and 42. At the end of this incredible accounting of all that's going on, the early church, the apostles, they're preaching. People are getting saved. They get thrown in jail. They get out of jail. And it says in verse 41 of chapter 5 in Acts, and they departed from the presence of the council. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the shame, suffer shame for his name. They counted it an honor to suffer shame for his name. And then verse 42. And daily in the temple, yep, and in every house, yep, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. So we don't cease. We continue to preach and to teach Jesus Christ. Temple, house to house. Right, Chad? Right, right. We do this. This is up. We can do this. And we continue. And we refine the mission. And we say, okay, God, how do you want us to go further with that? Let me just give you some neat examples that are specifics for 2021. Little things that have been noodling and being prayed about. And, and so they're coming to fruition in a lot of ways. Young adults, Tuesday evenings, that starts January 2021. They'll be gathering in the coffee house. Young singles and young marrieds. This Tuesday, they're having a little leadership powwow. They're going to straighten everything out. Well, I don't know. They're going to straighten Dwayne out. But they're going to get together in January and start every Tuesday night getting together. That's a right here in the temple thing that's going to go on. Missions on Sunday. There's four Sundays, fourth, fifth Sundays in each year. This year, the mission support team kind of came together in a collaborative effort in the Spirit of God and said, how about if we bring a focus to some of the mission work that we have supported in the past, we're unable to support them when it comes to the Word of God, when it comes to uh, bearing precious seed ministries, those type of things. Well, we're going to have a fifth Sunday, Missions on Sunday. We're going to keep focus, and we're going to bring it to Sunday. We've done much on, on Wednesdays, but we're going to do it on a Sunday. So January 31st is our first one. There's a special young man by the name of Dr. Charles Keene, that is going to come and preach. Do you, who, who's that? Oh, my gosh. I'll wait for you to learn. Hint. He's the man that God used to lead the upstart and vision of Bearing Precious Seeds ministry, first word that has been putting Bibles together for 40 years in Milford, Ohio. And also, too, as God led him out of the pastor to travel more, uh, First Bible International was birthed, which is a ministry of getting the gospel in Bible form all over the world with uh, New Testaments, John and Romans, and, of course, full Bibles and New Testament. So he will be here. That will be a special Sunday. We'll have two Sunday services in the morning. We're going to have a Sunday evening service as well. Oh, my goodness. What do you? Oh, my goodness. Well, that's the week in between the Super Bowl week, so... But even if it wasn't, we'd be here. Ha. Huh. Saturday mornings, starting in January, men's prayer. Got to do something about it, everybody. Men, we're going to get together 7 o'clock Saturday mornings here. Coffee house. What is it going to be? Donuts, uh, eggs? No. No. Nope. We're going to read scripture and pray. That's how you do a prayer meeting. That's the way I've learned. I've been in a lot of them. And uh, in my own, and some that really haven't put the focus on. But we're going to do that. We're going to pray. 7 o'clock every Saturday. 
So Jesus comes, or whatever. I believe it's the right thing to do. If we have 25,000 square feet, if there's too many men in the coffee house, we just spread all over the building and go pray somewhere in the temple. Making disciple makers. It starts in spring of 2021, an intentional effort. It'll be a classroom setting in the temple where we will take those that have said, hey, I've been discipled, I've learned the Bible a little bit, but I want to disciple someone else. We're going to put you through a refiner's fire. We want to teach you how to teach others and not necessarily just to get the cerebral activity going, which is very important, but understand what it costs to be a disciple maker. Biblical counseling. We do some pastoral counseling here. We're going to add a little bit of an aspect in the spring of 2021 with uh, professionals that are going to give time to be able to meet the needs through the Word of God because we know that there are needs that have to be met that way. That's something that we can do in the temple, and it will be overseen pastorally, but it's something that we will offer a walk through. Ministry leader prep, what is that? That is a place that will bridge those people that have been involved a little bit in ministry. They've grown. They've done a lot in serving. They also want to go maybe someday to the Bible Institute, but they haven't engaged that yet, but they want to lead a ministry. Or we see, I talked to Pastor Bobby, he says, boy, I, I see this person should lead a ministry. Okay, Pastor, how do we do that? How do we prove them? Well, that will be a hands-on training plus a Bible teaching methodology by which we train leaders and we prepare them to have that type of training that's in the temple ministry internship. This is both. You see the two little tags right there? We've got the in the temple, but we also got house to house. It's got a nice garage. It's bigger than my garage, actually, on that. Ministry internship. People have asked, what if there was someone that really wanted to be part of youth ministry or children's ministry, and they had the time? Well, the summer, June, July, August, we're going to put something in place. We've talked a bit about it. There's been different people that have been part of different pieces. We're going to intentionally have something like this in place, ministry internship. I've got some great pastors around here that are by my side that can be those resources to train. It'll be a hands-on thing, it'll be a Bible teaching time, and it will be something very instrumental in getting people to be part of ministry in a deeper way. Give thanks. Someone brought this to me in the last year or so. We're going to quarterly give thanks in our community. We had God Blessed America intentionally done uh, years ago to say month by month we'd pray for our city. I wonder if we kept up with that. Well, we're going to give thanks to our community. We're going to give thanks to our police department. We're going to give thanks to our uh, CJC, FPD, our uh, uh, first responders. Go to them and ask them, hey, what can we do to bless you? Bring them things that until they boot us out, to be able to, to really bless them and give thanks to them, the school district, the central office, different, and also to giving thanks quarterly as well in some form or fashion during the year with our people here. Salt and light, that we will look at reaching the southeast corridor. Uh, just, hey, listen, we've taken on big projects and done different things, but to reach the southeast corridor of Blue Springs, which I've been mentioning a great deal over the last few months, there's so many people that have moved in to the southeast and south part of Blue Springs. And then we look at what the Bible teaches us on how we're going to do it. So, you got a few minutes left. you got about five minutes. Just hang in there with me. Watch this. I want to show you two, three things that I simply can show you from the Word of God. You're in Acts chapter number two, I hope. If you're not, return back there. I will reference a couple of other verses, but you can write them down in your notes. I will have some up on the screen. You'll be able to follow along with me. So I just showed you the where and the intentional refine the mention aspects that are going to be added to what we're already doing with our discipleship, with our Bible Institute, with our fellowships that we have, with our Sunday morning groups and how they're still, everybody having the Bible being taught to them, the kids, everything, that stuff continues. We're just adding a little bit of fiber. We're going to refine the mission with our fellowship, with our ministry, of course, with our discipleship. So how do we do it? Three things. With one accord. It says there in verse number 46, continuing daily with one accord. To be in one accord, of course, I mentioned last week, continuing. And I mentioned that idea of being in one accord, which is to have one mind, a singular mind, or have a, a one accord thinking process, have a one-minded or one-souled, one-hearted passion with one accord. Well, there is a verse that just is verse number two, but... In Philippians chapter number 2, verses 1 through 4, 
Paul writes to the church. He wrote similar things to the church at Colossae because, of course, we have seen that him writing to Ephesus, Colossae, and Philippi, and Philemon during his first day in the prison, he said some common things. And one of them was in Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 1. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, right? Verse number two, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. You say you've mentioned this passage. Yes. Well, let's go a little further because when it goes to the second half of verse number two and you see that up there, having this same love and you, you see what they have with the, having the same love being of one accord and of one mind. It says in verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. This is what we do at First Bible Baptist Church. We need to refine that even deeper so that we look at verse number 4 and say, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That we do say, okay, as Paul's telling the church of Philippi, yes, just like we looked at last week, continuing and looking at that, we're reminded, as it says, in each one of those passages of Scripture, when you look up with one accord, that there is the same love and the one mind. It's a powerful statement. It's really, really important that we can have a refinement with the Lord, and we will see this principle continually come up that we would be of one accord. Gladness and singleness of heart. It's not gladness and singleness of heart like they're both in the heart. It's gladness, the joy of gladness as the Bible teaches us when we look up the meaning of it. And that is Hebrews chapter number 1 verse 9 if you want to write it in your references. But when you look up gladness, you see a reference to the oil of gladness. At feasts, people were anointed with the oil of gladness, as it says in Hebrews 1, 9, that alludes to this inaugural ceremony of anointing. And who was appointing to? The majesty and the power of the Son of God. It's an Old Testament principle that reveals itself even more clearly in the oil of gladness that is found when it comes to referencing the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ but also to the singleness of heart. This, this is an interesting thing, the singleness of heart. We live in an age of, in a time of, at least that I know in my life, that things become almost complicated on purpose. And we like simple. We need simple. Well, that's what he's referencing here when you look up in your Strong's Concordance. Singleness, simplicity of heart. Let's have a simple heart, a simple thinking. Let's not make it so convoluted and so confusing. Well, what did Paul do to help us with that? 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 is a reference I have up there. Verses 1 through 4. I've highlighted verse number 3. But he says, I would to God, ye could bear with me a little in my folly. And indeed, bear with me. <laughs> it's an interesting statement, he says. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Why? Because he can't be with them and they're doing things. They're working with things. They're being in the spirit. They're walking through things. They're, they have a refined mission, by the way, in Corinth because they went through some tough times and now they're working through some better stuff in their ministry flavor. He says, For I have espoused you to one husband that I present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's the way I made you. That's the way we planted this church. I was there for 18 months. I helped get this church off the ground, he's saying. He, verse, verse 3, here's his warning. But I fear, but I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. So think about that statement. He's really, really saying, hey, I fear that this could, could happen to you and that your minds would be corrupted with complicated things, instead of saying on the simplicity of Jesus Christ. Back to Acts chapter number 2, if you would like. Because Acts chapter number 2 now comes, brings us back to the idea that, hey, we had one accord. 
operating with one accord. We had gladness and singleness of heart. That's how we're going to do this, that we don't get caught up with the complications of this world, but stay in the simplicity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then that we would have a glad, excuse me, having favor with all the people. When I, when I look at this statement, and I've mentioned it quite a bit, the, sim, the simple statement of that is, hey, you know what? I love when people like us. But is that really what he's saying? Well, I want us to have a good testimony of the Lord. Yes. But is the testimony of the Lord of having favor with all the people based on our true gospel presence by the grace of God in all that we do? In Acts chapter number 2, as we reread that and looked at that, we're reminded that these people, they continued steadfastly in the doctrine of fellowship. They were in prayers, breaking of bread. When the fear came upon the people and every soul, the wonders and signs were done. They all believed were, were together. They had something in common. They sold their possessions. They parted them as men, every man in need. And then they, they said, okay, we're going to be in one accord in the temple. And we're going to go from house to house. And then we end up having a place where we praise God. And we also have favor with all the people. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 is where we'll tie this one together. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, Paul is saying to us that as a church, Corinth, in his first letter, I want you to stay on point, but remind, be reminded of who I am in the Lord, and what you have in the Lord is the same as how I got it, by his grace, by his goodness. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but, verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which is in me. He's saying, you know what? I am what I am, but I am in the Lord a little bit more. Church, that's what we are, in the Lord. And he's saying, it's not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And then he says in verse number 11, Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believed. We should have favor in the community because we've led so many people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And people say, thank you for telling me the good news. Thank you for welcoming me into the kingdom. Thank you for pro proclaiming and declaring the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we think about that, all you can do is be reminded of the Lord Jesus Christ growing in favor at the end of the Gospel of Luke in chapter number 2. And you don't have to turn there. But it is clear that Jesus Christ, in his young age, grew in stature. And he had favor with all the people, with all the men. God truly work through Jesus Christ to show us that the refining of the mission just as he worked through Paul the apostle in refining the mission put it on the church to have the same thing happen to us that we would be purified and that things would be clarified and things would be improved and things would be in a place where we would say Lord I surrender all Lord God I see what it means to have you refine the mission of our church and refine the mission of my life. I know that you've got a lot of things going on in your mind and heart, but right now this is our focus. And what it is for you and for me is this. When we look at what our life ought to look like over the next few days, weeks, months, and years as a church, people ought to say, hey, yeah, they're nice, they have a nice bunch of people, they're wonderful, they're loving and kind, but more than anything, the favor that's going to come to us as a people comes because 
we led people to the Lord Jesus Christ. We proclaimed the hope. We told them, hey, you know what? You need Jesus more than anything else. And more and more people in Blue Springs got saved. The Acts 2 project means that we're going to continue with one accord in the temple and house to house. And how? With one accord, gladness and singleness of heart, having favor with all the people. When you look up at that question there, and I've had it up there for a moment, do you ask yourself, what must you lay down? Have you asked yourself, will you ask yourself, what must I lay down for the Holy Spirit to refine the mission of our church? Because it's an individual thing, but also, too, it overflows into the corporate of us as a church. Would you bow your heads for a word of prayer as we have a time of prayer and invitation? Let me pray with you and pray for you and, and uh, see how God would have you to move and to act in doing business with him. Our Father in heaven, I know, Lord God, what you have given us this morning, and I thank you for everything from your word. I thank you most of all for the Lord Jesus Christ. He truly is our example. I thank you for Paul the Apostle, our example, and I thank you for Peter and John and everything that we see in what the church was able to accomplish in the temple and going house to house. I pray for us as a church that we would be truly centered up on all that you've called us to do, that we would follow all that you have in your word and by your spirit. Reveal to us what it is that we need to lay down so that God you can continue to refine the mission and find us faithful in Jesus' name. Please stand, if you would. Please respond as God would have you. Make the time, the effort for the next minute or two just to come to the altar. The invitation is very simple. What must you lay down for the Holy Spirit to refine the mission of our church? What do you need to lie down, lay down? What do I need to lay down? Please come. Please come.